really thinking more about um, both how teams got started in the improvement work and also, like Gary was alluding to, how, how some of these practices spread across the network and supported instructional improvement sort of across teams. Um, so my name is Jen Richards and we'll be diving into a little bit more of a network level look with a couple cases to illustrate. Uh, so we situate this study uh, in the context of both thinking about the affordances and also the challenges of research practice partnership work. Um, so RPPs have strong potential to generate and improve collective knowledge and novel solutions over time, in part due to the fact that they involve these mutualistic collaborations between practitioners and researchers uh, that really seek to intentionally integrate and build on diverse funds of knowledge and experiences. Um, as well as a focus on situated problems of practice, which enables locally meaningful knowledge building that in the context then of a network, if we step back, can also build across sites if positioned under a common aim and frame. But organizing for joint improvement work across practitioners and researchers is challenging, we all know, uh, especially when you're seeking to do so within the work of teaching. Um, so the studios that my colleagues mentioned were newer structures that started to mediate shifts from more traditional and individualized ways of working, sort of that egg crate model of everybody in their classrooms doing their own thing, uh, started to open up that space, uh, but it took varying degrees of time and effort for teams to work more collaboratively. So in this study, we examined how school-based PLCs in the NIC came to focus on collective teaching practices and improvement work, specifically asking two connected questions that you see up there. Uh, how did PLCs launch into lines of joint ongoing instructional improvement work and what level, what network level structures and roles supported such work. So we'll take a look at those sort of as they, they coexist and co-evolve with cases. Uh, briefly, to explore these questions, we really focused on data um, from the studios as these were primary sites where teams had extended opportunities to engage in sense-making talk around instruction together. Uh, we also examined the range of data sources that you see here. And we were really looking to identify and analyze what we call improvement launches. Um, so our operational definition of what that thing is, is an improvement launch we're considering to be a series of conversations where a PLC specified and started testing and refining a science teaching practice. In this study, we especially wanted to pay attention to launches that initiated lines of ongoing practice improvement over time. So things that went beyond the bounds of a single studio trying to improve something within a structure to where we had evidence of multiple team members pursuing and shaping a practice over multiple studio days and their own individual classroom teaching. And then to unpack how teams launched into improvement work, we focused on characterizing the content and nature of PLC's discourse and as well as their interactions with tools prior to and during launches. Um, and here we were drawing on insights from both improvement science and studies of high-functioning PLCs that demonstrate how discourse and tools can serve as critical mediators of teams' opportunities to learn and improve practice. Um, you'll see the, the diagram from Suyun earlier also. Uh, we considered how teams worked with data and theory of student learning in shaping instruction. So I want to start with a high-level overview. So consider this to be sort of the highest level overview that you'll see uh, during this particular talk. Uh, in total, we identified 16 distinct improvement launches across the NIC from 2013 to 2017, so that whole four-year span. And you can see up here that they clustered into three distinct patterns that represented how, how teams got started in their collective work on practice. And these are represented by the different colors. So the green, is a pattern that we call local practice development. Uh, that's very similar to the kinds of things that Carrie was just describing, where teams are sort of generating uh, practices in-house. Uh, the second is spread and local adaptation, so spread of a practice and teams sort of taking those up in particular ways. And then third is practice convergence, um, which is teams <coughs> thinking about how a given practice might support a practice that I'm already working on and seeking to improve and thinking about how these things can work together. Um, so just to walk through this diagram a little bit, um, we have schools listed on the y-axis and years listed on the x-axis. And what you see as circles 
are what we would count as an improvement launch. And then the boxes that are sort of building from those represent the line of improvement work that persisted on a particular practice. So you can kind of see different lengths of time, different intersections, um, and that's something that we go into more in the full paper. So if we look, just to contextualize it, if we look up top at Lewitt, this is the work on structured talk that mm -hmm. Carrie was talking about, um, which fits sort of a more general launch pattern of a, a PLC, including all of these role actors really locally defining a practice. So briefly, in the remainder of our time, um, I'll briefly describe two of these patterns with illustrative examples, and then highlight different ways that network level structures and roles support an improvement work. Uh, briefly, local practice development uh, was something that we saw occurred in seven of the 16 launches across the network. And this pattern involved uh, PLCs in generating and iterating on homegrown teaching practices and classroom tools to serve purposes that they had identified for student learning. Um, importantly, this actually resulted in practices that were novel to the network as a whole. So there was a lot of knowledge generation happening in this kind of space in these proximal interactions. Uh, launches of this sort were frequently supported by use of a vision tool that helped teams define a common aim for learning. So what you see in the picture there is actually a super nascent version of the driver diagram, the big driver diagram that Jessica showed about what happened after five years. Um, so this was one team's work seeking to identify their aim and to start to build out possible um, instructional ideas that could support uh, their particular aim. So again, in Lewitt's case, they were looking to increase the richness and rigor of student-to-student -student discourse. And we can see some of the ideas that they started wrestling with, even right off the bat, were ha the idea of having some kind of structure for discourse. So it was a natural slot sort of for a more structured talk practice to be integrated in that space. Uh, also seen in Lewitt's examples and others that fit this pattern, we saw that teams often drew on existing patterns of sense-making talk as they engaged in specification and initial refinement of practice. Um, so we saw them reasoning about instructional practice in relation to uh, student learning data and or theory, sort of as a, a foundation that they then built on in this space. What's more interesting, in the second year of the project, uh, we started to see more spread. So. Uh, this pattern involved PLCs developing local variations of teaching practices that were originally developed by other PLCs. So here the example that you can kind of see up top is Washington High School in their second year picking up structured talk from Lewitt. Um, so we'll just talk briefly about what that looked like, what it looked like to locally adapt, um, and just think through which are the kinds of practices that spread. So importantly, this, uh, this kind of launch tended to be supported by coordinated sets of pedagogical and inquiry tools that were developed by coaches and researchers. And then these were shared either directly by those role actors or through the convenings that Jessica was talking about earlier. So pedagogical tools, tools embedding knowledge, really reified um, practice-based knowledge that teams had generated themselves. And then the inquiry tools were designed to support practice-specific data collection in classrooms. And again, these included, you can see at the forefront example, uh, exit tickets that invited students' perspectives and self-reports on particular practices. And then I won't say too much about this, but the pattern that we tended to see was that teams would try out the new practice. They often collected data um, just from these initial attempts, often this student self-report data. And then they would identify local problems and things they wanted to work on from there. Um, so that's, that's how we saw local adaptations take form, is they were data informed in the first place. What's interesting is not all practices spread the same, right? So this is the diagram you saw before, but now layered on with arrows, showing what kinds of, pra how practices spread in the network. And what you can see is that structured talk was actually a practice that spread from Lewitt to five other schools in the network and supported both the start of improvement work as well as um, some of that practice convergence work. They used structured talk in service of aims like modeling, for example, in Sue Young's conversation. Um, so at a network level, we actually note that structured talk seemed to function as a foothold practice 
which felt like an emergent network level structure that supported improvement work across PLCs. So the very practices that can be developed can become some of those emergent network level structures. So super briefly, three improvement launch patterns illustrate that there are really multiple ways into specifying and improving instruction, which is important to think about when designing from a systems perspective. <coughs> Um, they were almost all mediated by different network level tools, and we hypothesized that coupling um, practice-specific pedagogical and inquiry tools is something that allowed both spread, but with the continuing orientation toward improvement work. So it's not spread and just taking it up. Um, and then we want to further explore the role of foothold practices in the network, and also some of the characteristics about what, what could make something a foothold. So things like accessibility, adaptability to different contexts and purposes were things that we saw structured talk fit. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Christine, who's going to think with us a little bit about how did principles come into this work. <laughs> 